Tonight's story of the Twilight Zone is somewhat unique and calls for a different kind of introduction. Nothing is rehearsed. There is no script. We don't know what will happen. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Disney MGM Studios is proud to present W Radio, your information station. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the WDW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World information station. I am your host, Lou Mangello, and this is show number 339 for the week of October 13th, 2013. I'm here to help you have the best possible Disney vacation experience and bring you a little bit of Disney magic wherever you are with this podcast, my new Disney in a Minute videos, the blog, live broadcasts, special events, my Walt Disney World trivia books, CDs, and more. You can find everything over at www.radio.com. This week's show is brought to you by the new book, Ears of Steel, the new guidebook that asks, are you man enough to go to Walt Disney World? It's aimed right at guys who think they're a little bit too macho for a place like Disney. It focuses on the things at Walt Disney World that appeal to men of all ages. It's fun, funny, and you can get a free excerpt by visiting the Intrepid Traveler's website over at intrepidtraveler.com. So when we visit Walt Disney World, we take a great deal of time planning for our vacation where we stay, when we will eat, what we'll do, what we're going to see. And while we're there, whether it be alone or with family or friends, we try and capture the moments, the memories, the details, and the stories that we want to save and share. But for most of us, we are not professional photographers. Far from it. So this week, I'm joined by someone who's going to help us learn how to take better photographs at Walt Disney World in our Disney Photography 101. We'll discuss everything from camera gear to shooting with your smartphone, do's and don'ts, lighting, shooting at night, fireworks, on-ride photos, what to do after you get home, and much, much more. When we're done, I think you're going to have some real actionable tips and tricks to take better photos on your next vacation. I'll then have the answer to our last Walt Disney World trivia question of the week and pose a new challenge for your chance to win a Disney prize package. Then stay tuned at the end of the show for some updates, announcements, and more of your voicemails. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WDW Radio Show. Approximately 5% of all photographs taken in the United States each year are taken at Walt Disney World. And Cinderella Castle is arguably the most photographed or one of the most photographed buildings in the entire world. And when we visit the parks, we take photos of everything from family and friends to attractions and, for some of us, obscure details like garbage cans, pavement, and tiny items on distant shelves. But for many of us who are not professional, and by professional I mean good photographers, um, we're not good by a long shot. Uh, In fact, I admittedly have no idea what I'm doing. When I come to the parks, I point and I shoot and I hope for the best. And whether you shoot with your expensive DSLR or your smartphone, uh, there are definitely some tips and tricks I have to imagine that we can follow to get the most out of our photos and in turn, Uh, the best way to capture our memories and take them back with us. So this week, I'm in the Magic Kingdom with someone that does know what he is doing. Uh, He is Corey Disbrow, and he runs the DisneyPhotographyBlog.com, and he's going to share some Walt Disney World photography kind of one-on-one tips with us. So, uh, Corey, welcome to the show. Uh, Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. I've been listening for a long time, so uh, this is pretty cool. No, this is awesome, because look, I've been a fan of your stuff for a long time. Again, you are not doing the I'm taking out my little... $13 $13 disposable camera and shooting. You you are the guy that knows you're doing. I mean, some of the stuff that you've put out there online and, and on the site and on your apps and stuff like that is nothing short of spectacular. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, I mean, I just point and shoot, too. I've just bankrupted myself, <laughs> you know, in the process with all the expensive camera gear. So, But I have a feeling it's not about the camera. 
as it is about the photographer, because I could take that that oh so pricey thing you have sitting delicately perched on this table and not bring out anything like what the kind of stuff that you've done. Well, I mean, you're very right, uh, and a lot of the things that people will talk about, a lot of the the gear conversations on the internet, whether you're oh, do you shoot Canon, do you shoot Nikon, Sony, Fuji, whatever brand is out there. Uh, it's it's really the the brain and the eye that that sits behind the camera and the lens that that makes the images. Uh, you could shoot with a Canon 1DX, which without any lenses attached to it retails for about seven thousand dollars. And if you don't know what you're doing, you're you're not going to achieve any results. Yeah. I don't think that they're selling that in the GF Camera Center on Main Street. <laughs> no, no, I I think they still have some disposable cameras there though. So if you're looking into that, that's a definite option. Do they even sell film? Like, does they ever actually even sell film anymore? You know, I think a lot of people are buying their film on, like, eBay and stuff now. Because Kodak is done. Uh, I mean, almost all the major companies, like Fujifilm, has switched to almost entirely digital at this point. But uh, some people still shoot with it. They, they make it work, but they spend hours and hours developing and spending lots of money at this point. So it's not, it's not very cost efficient anymore. It's like the guy that's still like vinyl. Like, there's just something about the way vinyl sounds, or something about the way film might look. But, but I think you're right. And, and I think, and I know you've heard this phrase before, you know, the best camera is the one that you have in your hand. It's the one that you have with, with you. Oh, that's, that's absolutely true. I mean, I have uh, three different options for myself when it comes to taking photos. I have uh, the big, bulky, professional, full-frame DSLR kit. Uh, I have a, a smaller uh, mirrorless camera, which is a new, it's a newish type of technology that they've come out with uh, in the industry over the past few years. That is uh, getting really high uh, image quality. And then I also I have an iPhone 5 that, uh, which is like like we've talked about, the best camera is the one you have on you. Uh, the cameras and smartphones nowadays have they've become really tremendous, especially when you're outside shooting at Disney when it's you know in the bright sunlight. Uh, it's very easy to capture quality images even with with something like an iPhone or an Android phone. Yeah, I mean we were saying before I don't even bother taking my you know little point and shoot camera anymore because I'm taking better pictures. It's easier for me to share them right from my phone. Well, yeah, I mean we're we're sitting here right now and Lou Lou has his newly acquired iPhone 5s, which uh, has a, a burst rate where it takes. 10 frames a second. It does slow motion video at 120 frames a second. Uh, you can do panoramas with it. Uh, and that's all. Even the optical zoom, you know, as long as you don't get too far up. I mean, even the optical zoom looks really good. Yeah. And that's all stuff that, that just. Sorry, the digital zoom, yeah. It just all comes with the phone. You don't have to pay extra for that. There are no lenses that you have to buy. Uh, it's. We're, we're in a new age, and, and I think you see that in uh, Twitter and Instagram and, and Facebook and everything. The sharing of photos has become just a million times what it, even what it was four or five years ago. It's, it's really unbelievable. Well, gone are the days where you used to have to take pictures, go home, get them developed, and then find ways to share them. You know, uh, listen, I'm showing my age when you used to, you know, put them in the, uh, in the carousel projector and like, okay, everybody's going to sit down and watch two hours of slides from, you know, wherever I was. It's instantaneous now, you know, especially with things like, uh, you know, especially Instagram has become, and now with video on Instagram, um, we want instant gratification. Even you see Disney sort of getting in on it, sort of not just creating their own content, but sharing content that's created by us, the consumers and the guests. Yeah, they, the, the Walt Disney Company has done a lot of things. They've, uh, they've started their own Instagram, they're, they're on Twitter, uh, putting images out, they're sharing images that people are taking in the parks uh, that are getting mentioned by them. Um, they've started Tumblr projects that uh, I've had some friends that have been projects uh, involved in projects with them. Um, I mean, it's, it's like you said, it's all about instant gratification the same way that all the news blogs are nowadays where people used to go out to media events and they'd have to edit all their photos when they came home, spend four hours doing a blog post. There's Wi-Fi in all the parks now. So they take their pictures, they upload them right onto the computer. They're, everybody's got a, a netbook or a MacBook Air or something and those posts are up, you know, 20 minutes after all the events are done. So it's, it's an interesting day that we live in. And to a certain degree, you can almost do more with your phone because you can get, you know, physical accessories for it in terms of fisheye lenses and, and macro lenses. But with the number of apps that give you filters and stitch photos together, I mean, you can not only do the stuff right on your phone, but you can do it and share it on the spot as opposed to being able to do it with your, you know... Canon, what are you shooting with that? What's this guy? Uh, this is a it's a Canon 5D Mark III, uh, which is um, I think it does register as a professional camera for Canon. 
Uh, it's not their their highest grade professional camera. Like it's not what you're going to see on the sidelines at an NFL game. Um, but but it is a, a full frame sensor. It's the same size sensor as what you used to see in like a 35 millimeter film camera. Uh, a lot of the uh, more cost-efficient options that are out there nowadays. They have smaller sensors uh, to keep the price down, make the lenses smaller. Um, they still produce fantastic images. They're just uh, they're not as good sometimes in like low-light situations, or they might not be as, as quick to focus on a subject or something. So, well, let's talk about sort of just the basics of taking pictures because again, you know, this is uh, this is not something that I am admittedly very good at. I think a lot of us probably come home and, and say, you know. We're taking a ton of pictures, which is probably a great tip with, you know, with SD cards in your phone. Just keep shooting, and eventually you'll find one that you like, unlike film where you're like, hey, I've got 24 shots. i got to make these count. But what are some tips, just some basic things when you come to the parks that we can do to get better pictures? Um, I think one of the first ones, I mean, this is a, a complete pet peeve of mine. I'm a relatively neurotic person when it comes to my photography, but uh, taking a photo that is actually straight and level you know is is a really it's it sounds like a very simple process but it really isn't you see so many photos on uh Flickr, uh which is which is a site that's run by yahoo it's one of the largest photo sharing sites in the world or uh, even on twitter or the other social networks where uh you'll see a shot of cinderella castle or the tree of life or something and it's like just a couple degrees tilting and it kind of looks like the castle is toppling a little bit you know things like that um, we're doing that on purpose. We're trying to be creative. We're trying to be uh, do some of those funky angles that you guys do. Well, and there there is a very there is a very fine line between doing that. You can put angles on photos, but the, the catch with doing an angle is that you want your your audience to know just by looking at the photo that the photographer's intent was to put an angle on it. If they have to think about it, you're probably not doing it right. <laughs> um, so I mean, you know, doing that kind of thing will if you're planning on taking photos to put in a uh, whether it be a, an e-photo album or if you want to print something to put on a coffee table or whatever, uh, that that's really important because seeing all those things off balance like that, you know, it, it just gives it a more. It's the way it was meant to be seen. It's the way your eyes see it, as long as you're wearing the, the same shoes on both feet. So. Well, and even doesn't the iPhone, the, the I think the five or iOS seven, doesn't the camera now have a horizontal level in there? Um, there, there is a leveler built in um, in, in one of the apps, uh, and you have a grid now when you pull up on your camera, so you can actually use the, the grid lines to, to line things up straight. So if you're shooting, like, the Tower of Terror, you can line one of the grid lines up with one of the vertical lines on the building, and, you know, nine times out of ten, you'll get something that's, that's pretty close to straight and level. So uh, talking about the grid lines, I'm sure educate me. You know, tell it to me like I'm a four-year-old. The rule of thirds. We hear about it all the time because everybody sort of takes this, the pictures the same way. If you're taking a picture of the family, they're in the middle of the frame, and that not necessarily isn't always the best way to do it, is it? Um, no, it's not always. Uh, I mean, they call it the rule of thirds. Um, obviously, more like guidelines. Yeah, they, they, are, they really are. It's like the pirate code. It's more like guidelines because uh, for everything that you're supposed to do, there's always an interesting way to break from the mold and do something different. Uh, and it, you can really branch out and be creative by doing that. Um, but the rule of thirds is if you think about the, the frame of uh, your photo, if you divided it up into nine blocks, so you have uh, a couple lines going in a vertical uh, orientation and a couple lines going in horizontal, where those lines cross are the thirds of the frame. Uh, and it's the rule of thirds is the idea that you want to position your subject in one of those intersecting points. Um, so instead of every single photo being... Uh, the person you're taking a portrait of or Cinderella Castle or Spaceship Birds from being dead center to, you know, maybe put that a little bit a third of the way across the frame or a quarter of the way across the frame or something. Um, that way it, it changes the perspective. It adds some dead space. Uh, it can make it so that you can add a secondary element to the background that might be hidden if your subject is right in the center. Um, you know, things like that. I mean, I, I kind of try to follow that rule pretty often um, with, with my cameras uh, and with an iPhone even at this point, too. You can change focus points just by tapping on the screen and focusing where you want. Uh, so if you follow those rules, you, you can place your subjects, compositionally speaking, where you want them to be. Uh, you're not really forced anymore to, to put something dead center, and that's the only place it'll focus. So, And I guess it holds true whether you're taking a picture of your family in front of the Tree of Life or your kid with Winnie the Pooh. They don't have to be in the middle all the time. You sort of put them on one side or the other and get a little bit of a better effect. 
No, a- absolutely not. Uh, one of the things that right now we're, we're recording in, it's like autumn. That doesn't feel like it, but... Uh, it's, it's 97 degrees. It's autumn. <laughs> uh, it's October 12th or something, and we're here getting clobbered by heat. But uh, the pumpkins that are out on all the light posts on Main Street, uh, if you place them on one of those intersecting points in the rule of thirds, you can very easily put Cinderella Castle on one of the other points, and you have... Even if Cinderella Castle is not tack sharp, if it's uh, the background is even a little bit diffused, you're not only getting that Mickey pumpkin, but you're also getting a secondary element that gives your viewer a little bit better perspective on where you are. I mean, you could go to my mom's front lawn in New Jersey, Lou and my old stomping grounds, um, and you could see a Mickey pumpkin on someone's front lawn. But uh, when you add Cinderella Castle to the background like that, it, it's an instant uh, indicator of where this photo was taken. All right, what are some other tips? Uh, again, we, we sort of have what we should use is what we have. Right? We're not telling people that in order to get good picture, you have to go out and buy new equipment. Where you sort of position your, your subjects in, what are some other tips to sort of get the most of our photos? Because obviously we're doing everything from taking pictures of our families, the characters, the rides, the, the buildings. I mean, obviously there's no sort of um, hard and fast rule, but some other sort of guidelines. Yeah, um, one of the ones that, that I always use for people who are coming down here on vacations is a lot of people down here don't understand just how ridiculously powerful the Florida sun is. Um, The sun here is really, really harsh. And photography is, if you want to, you know, dive really deep and and get kind of philosophical about it, it's a study of light. Everything from photography comes from light. If the light is bad, the photo is not going to be good. Um, So one, one great rule that you can apply to your photography is when you're out in the daylight, um, when you can feel the sun, if the sun is hitting you on your face or on your chest, um, chances are you're facing the wrong direction. If the sun is on the back of your neck, chances are that that is the best direction for you to be standing in to get a nice, rich Florida blue sky with the Andes room puffy clouds that, that we love so much about being down here. Um, and like I said with the rule of thirds, those rules can always be broken. You can shoot directly into the sun and get flare and starbursts that come off the sun and everything, but if you're going for a, just a nice, solid, clean exposure of something, uh, having the sun on the back of your neck is a, is a really great place to start, which I understand when people come down here on vacations, time is a constraint, necessarily uh, want to take photos of Splash Mountain, but you're only over by Splash Mountain at a certain time. By all means, you know, fire away, do what you need to do, but um, the half of the park that you're looking at when the sun is on your back uh, is going to give you a, a lot of a lot of quality shots that might not even need any any post processing or editing, whether it even be with your iPhone or if you're using Photoshop or Lightroom or any computer photo editing software. Yeah, and that's again that's something else we can talk about too. Is once you've got the pictures, you know what what do you do with them? How do you actually sort of make them better once you get home, or how do you uh, edit them and share them? But while you're talking about lighting um, and the blazing sun. Um, one of the things too I think people we, we run into problems with a lot especially with simple cameras like an iPhone camera or a, or a point and shoot is trying to take pictures at night um, nighttime shots low light shots fireworks is probably a whole nother yeah uh, nighttime is where it gets a little bit trickier and it, it is where it gets a little bit more uh, gear required uh, you might have the need to have some some nicer equipment. Uh, the main one for nighttime photography and fireworks photography is a tripod, uh, because the main idea for success when you're doing that type of photography is that you're doing long exposures. Um, when you have your iPhone out or your regular camera and you're in the daytime, you're taking photos at a shutter speed of one one hundredth of a second, one one thousandth of a second. Uh, in some cases, even like my camera goes all the way up to one eight thousandth of a second. That's how fast the shutter clicks. Uh, when you're doing fireworks or nighttime photos, um, some of my favorite nighttime photos that I've taken are 85 second long exposures. And what that does is that exposes to get a really bright nighttime sky. Uh, and then, you know, I'll also do a a photo of the same scene but with a shorter exposure to control all the bright lights on like the castle or like a big thunder mountain or something like that and i'll actually use software to to blend them in um so that's where it gets a little bit trickier admittedly um even if you're shooting with an iphone though i know that uh there's a company called joby uh j-o-b-y they make what's called the gorilla pod which is like a a little mini tripod you can wrap around handrails and whatnot um they make 
uh, a model specifically for the iPhone now. Uh, I actually got a chance to, to play with one because we're, we were giving them out as a a contest for the for the photography blog, and they're they're pretty cool, man. I mean, you can uh, you can download applications that are different from like an iPhone camera or an Android camera, where you can put it on a self timer and uh, make some alterations uh, to the way the camera is taking the picture, and then you can essentially shoot off a tripod with an iPhone. But um, for the best result, uh, that's that's where having an actual camera with with a tripod and uh, you know, I use a, a cable release for the shutter that actually plugs into my camera. It's a remote that I hold in my hand while the camera's sitting on the tripod. So you don't have to actually touch the camera and make it shake. Exactly, because if you get any camera shake when you're doing a, a really long exposure like that, uh, things are going to blur, and that's that's the last thing you want. That's one of the biggest problems I see. Uh, even when I just walk through and I watch people taking pictures at night, and they get really frustrated with their camera. Why is this so blurry? I can't believe it. What's going on? It's because they're they're trying to handhold photos that require a one, two, three second long exposure. It doesn't sound like a long time, but it, but it is. Nobody's hand is that steady. It, well, yeah, especially my type one diabetic hands. They're <laughs> awful. I I have uh, I have lenses that have image stabilization in them, and one of my cameras, the actual camera body, has image stabilization built in. Um, which is also a feature of the the new iPhone. The, the new iPhone camera has image stabilization built in too, so um, that'll help for for nighttime stuff. Um, if you're taking pictures of people, uh, you you can use flash, but uh, flash is only so powerful. Um, you know, if you're trying to take a picture of Spaceship Earth from across World Showcase Lagoon, your little tiny flash on your iPhone <laughs> is not going to light a 182 foot tall uh, geodesic sphere. Um, but, I mean, flash can be used in a, in a pinch when it comes to people, especially uh, the new iPhone with the, the dual flash that right. accurately uh, takes color temperature into account, so you're getting somewhat accurate skin tones and whatnot on every different subject in real time. I mean, that's those are some of the advancements that are coming down the pipeline that are pretty incredible. Yeah. And it's interesting, too, because now, you know, you see what's happened over the years. <clears throat> Excuse me, you stand on Main Street, you were saying, and you watch the castle during the fireworks show. And, you know, now you see this, there's a sea of white lights in front of you from all those people holding up. Are, that little kid over there is so frustrated because the pictures he was taking on his iPad last night of the, of the, of the, of the fireworks did not come out as he intended. But, yeah, all those people, you've got to be looking at them saying you know that your pictures are going to come out for the most part probably pretty pretty blurry because you are trying to hold on your hand and again sort of laughing at not laughing at but the uh when you see people holding up their ipads trying to t- take pictures of wishes more, more times I'm, I'm frustrated with them because they're getting in the way of my camera uh the, the there's a whole joke if you have the opportunity go on twitter and search for wdw ipadography it, it, it's just hysterical it's all photos of people taking uh ipad pictures in the parks and holding this 10-inch tablet high over their head during a castle show or something. Uh, but I mean, with with something like like an iOS device, whether it be an iPad or an iPhone or something, during the day, they're they're great. Uh, evening is where it's going to get uh, a little bit on the the tricky side. So, um, a lot of times, if I if I don't have the equipment with me to do nighttime photography, I just won't do it. Uh, I have the luxury of being a local down here and living in Florida, so I can come back and do it if I want to. But um, you know, there are times where I'm here often. I have thousands of Disney photos on my computer that I just take a step back and remember why I enjoyed coming here in the first place, which was just coming to visit the parks and not just to take photos of them. So um, there, there has to be a, a love of what you're shooting and, and a passion for what you're taking pictures of, or else it's not going to come through in, in your work. So, And I think, too, for a lot of us that are amateurs, we're just coming here on vacation uh, one of the other times that it, it's somewhat frustrating to take pictures other than nighttime is we try and capture stuff on the attractions themselves. Yeah, um, and for taking pictures of the attractions themselves, the one thing that above all I suggest to everyone is follow the rules and don't use a flash. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times uh, I have seen other people's experiences be ruined by someone with a huge pop-up flash on there, whether it be a DSLR or like a bridge camera or something, uh, you know, things like Pirates of the Caribbean, that that ride is very dark for a reason. It's called a dark ride. When you pop a flash on it, it uh, it illuminates the scenes. It kind of kills the, uh, 
I guess you could say it ruins the magic for some people because you can see some things that the Imagineers did not want you to see. Uh, and I, I think it just becomes a, a common courtesy thing. Uh, first time guests that are riding an attraction like that, I, you know, just to get a photo, I don't think it's worth it to, to ruin someone's experience like that. Um, so Flash, if you can nix it or keep it to a, a bare minimum, um, one of the other ways you can you can take photos of the dark rides is uh, there is a function on every single camera, um, non-smartphone, I'm, I'm talking about like a regular camera, uh, that's called ISO. ISO is a, a term that came from film. Uh, when you used to buy Kodak film, it would be ISO 400 or ISO 1600. Uh, those are different film speeds. Uh, and the higher the number, the more capable you are of shooting in low light. So when I'm shooting... Pirates of the Caribbean or the Haunted Mansion or any any Disney dark ride, uh, I'm always shooting in the realm of ISO 3200 or ISO 6400 in more extreme uh, cases. And what that does is it allows more light to be let into the camera's sensor. Uh, that way you don't have to use a flash to compensate for how dark it is. It'll actually just pick up the ambient light that uh, is ever so cautiously placed by the people who design the attractions. Um, now, again, that's kind of like nighttime photography. It, it is a little bit more on the gear-specific side, but um, I have seen people, when they get an e-stop on a dark ride, take a brilliant shot with an iPhone. You know, it, it is it is possible. Um, and, you know, any point-and-shoot or entry-level SLR or mirrorless camera, if you can get yourself out of that evil green box that is auto mode you I, really, you're, re you're right you're reading my mind as to where I was at right yeah so I mean if you can get out of that out of that auto mode there it opens up your options of what you can do tenfold uh, you can manually adjust your settings so that you can have them the way that you want them to be uh, to actually achieve what you're trying to achieve so um, the auto auto is great for people who want to just point and shoot they're out in the daylight it'll it'll get them a good exposure and whatnot but if you're if you're doing things that are that are trickier low light situations uh, parades fast motion something like lights motors action uh, or kilimanjaro safaris you know you're going to want to learn your camera read the manual download a pdf off the internet and whatnot uh and that's that's really the best way to to achieve results and that's what i was asking about because i i'm guilty of that you know even w with the, the lowest and least expensive point and shoot cameras they normally have that little dial on top that many of us are afraid to move off of you know you see m or you see p and there's a very sort of simple menu that you can all, oftentimes scroll through and it has portrait mode nighttime mode whatever but I'm deathly afraid if I'm like, you know what, the camera knows better of what it's doing than I do. I'm just going to leave it on auto, and that's obviously not the way to do it. Right, and uh, one of the best ways to get around that is, uh, I don't know if it's in its, like, third or fourth edition at this point, but there's a, there's a wonderful book that you can get on, on Amazon or any Barnes & Noble-type website. Uh, it's called Understanding Exposure, and it's written by a guy named Brian Peterson. Uh, within that book, he goes into great detail about what's called the exposure triangle, which is a combination of... Uh, ISO, which I mentioned before, uh, shutter speed, which is how fast the uh, the camera shutter is open to allow light to hit the sensor, and then the aperture on the lens, which is uh, the circle on the lens that is letting the light through, how big or how small that circle is. Uh, and it shows inside the book how the three of those relate to each other and how by changing one, you, you know, every action has an equal or opposite reaction from the other parts of that triangle, uh, and it kind of makes it so that you have the power and you have the the you're set up for success basically to to tackle any situation. And for a lot of those other modes that are sort of pre-programmed into the cameras, like a portrait mode or a nighttime mode, are those normally pretty good? You know, so if that's what you're going to be doing, don't be afraid to sort of go with some of those presets. Um, some of them are great um, if if you're in a perfect world situation. Um, Nine times out of ten, I probably wouldn't suggest going to them because what they're doing is they're they're still it's like a glorified auto mode. It's a if you go into sport mode, it's you're still in auto, but the camera is thinking more in terms of the quickness of the shutter speed instead of the aperture of the ISO. Uh, or if you go into nighttime mode, it's thinking more of capturing what's in the shadows instead of the super bright lights and whatnot. Um, I I tried using those when I had a camera back in the day before photography was a, 
a serious endeavor of mine, and I never got results that I was happy with. Uh, the the real the real key is. Uh, there are three modes on any camera that you can use. One is called aperture priority, one is called shutter priority, and one is called fully manual mode. Uh, those three are, are really the, the key to, to breaking out of the, the box that, that is the auto mode that kind of constrains 90% of people that are holding a camera in their hand. Well, I think because for, for most people you know, that come here, they are coming as a couple, they're with their friends, or... You know, the typical family, it's mom, dad, the two and a half kids, and they are, you have no other choice but to run and gun and capture as fast as you can. Yeah, uh, and I mean, I think it is very possible to get great vacation shots if you take 20 minutes before your vacation to look over your camera's manual and see how everything works and see what buttons do what. Uh, I would say that... Uh, 90% of people that, that are holding a camera in their hand don't ever do that. They buy a camera, take it out of the box, and, all right, let's go. Or they'll, or they're, some people rent cameras. Uh, renting cameras is great because sometimes you can't afford what you're trying to rent, uh, but you're still doing a disservice to yourself if you're spending all that money on renting it and not taking a little bit of time to, to just get to know the camera and, and learn some of its ins and outs. And what, what about some other tips for those of us that do have to sort of come here and run and gun and we're just doing the typical, it's my once every three to five year vacation at Walt Disney World? Um, take advantage of the digital age. Uh, like you kind of alluded to before, uh, SD cards are dirt cheap now. You can get 32 gig SD cards for $30 on Amazon. Uh, and with a, a traditional point and shoot or entry level SLR camera, if you're if you're shooting in just just JPEG mode and you're not shooting in what's called RAW mode, the file sizes are very small. You can fit thousands of photos on one card. Uh, and with that, it gives you the ability to take... If you see something you like and you want to make sure you really get it, take three or four pictures of the same thing, you know, because there are little variables that could... You, the camera could miss focus. You could have someone bump into you because you're blocking the line at the Haunted Mansion to get a picture of one of the tombstones. Uh, you know, all, all sorts of things like that. You know, shoot as, as much as you can um, without making your family hate you. Um, and, and I think you can go back and when you upload everything into your iPhoto library or whatever the PC equivalent of that is, and you can delete the stuff that you don't like, uh, and it gives you a better chance of success. Like one of the articles we just did on the website, uh, we, we're doing a series where all the guys that contribute share their thoughts about certain things and one of the things was the, the Halloween parade here at the, the party all four of us said shoot as much as you can and look at the LCD screen later because that parade is so tough that there are so many things that could get in the way and ruin a shot that you, you really need to we kind of call it uh, spray and pray just shoot as much as you can and hope you got something that works out um, so that's that's huge um, I would say for, for a family who's coming down, uh, a general purpose lens, if you're using a, an interchangeable lens system, uh, is, is a pretty solid bet. One that will cover um, a wide range of focal lengths, so that way you can do your landscape-ish shots of uh, Spaceship Earth, and you can also still zoom in quite a ways and do portraits of the kids with the characters or, uh, you know, the family, or if you're... If you're like me and a total nerd, you can get into the details of Walt Disney World and whatnot uh, just the same. Um, and then one other suggestion would be something like a like a 50 millimeter lens. Uh, I know that both Canon and Nikon, for their DSLR systems, make a 50 millimeter lens uh, that opens up to an aperture of f 1.8, which is a really wide aperture, uh, which really makes it nice for portraits, where you can kind of blur out the background and isolate your subject. Um, and it also helps in the dark rides because having that wider aperture allows the camera to let more light in um, so it's easier to get a faster shutter speed. Those retail for around $100. Uh, that's one of the best bargains for any starting photographer is a 50 millimeter lens. Uh, I have friends, one of my best friends is, he's been at photography for seven or eight years now and he's had his 50 for probably five or six of those years and he never found the need to upgrade to a better version of it or spend more money he still uses it and he still gets great results with it so um camera lenses last a long time they hold their value very well uh and they tend to carry over from body to body i mean i'm on my oh, i want to say fourth or fifth dslr body now and all the lenses i bought when i first started still work on it uh, for the most part so 
the lenses that you buy are an investment that you hold on to for a long time. Um, so you can start with something that's not so expensive and get photos that you really like without breaking the bank. And if you decide one day that you want to be completely insane like me and put yourself in the poorhouse by spending money on camera gear, you can do that. So. But, you, you know, the, the nice thing is, like I said, you don't have to. You know, your, your iPhone in your pocket or your Android device in your pocket is, is a capable camera at this point. And then even as you start to sort of move up into the point and shoot and, you know, we're talking about things like mirrorless, which is still a, a more compact size, but you can have the interchangeable lenses. If somebody wants to say, all right, you know what, I'm going on my family's vacation. I want to take something better than just my iPhone. And they want to sort of go up to a point and shoot or even more without going all the way to, to the, the bank breaking mode. <laughs> what are some things they should look for? Because I hear people say, oh, this one has a 700 time digital zoom. Well, that's not necessarily the, the best thing for, you know, you're not going to be able to get good pictures from far away. Yeah, I would, I would stay away from marketing buzzwords like digital zoom. Uh, stick with optical zoom. Optical zoom is uh, a mechanical feature of the lens that is built into the camera. Digital zoom is all software based so you're not going to get the same results out of it even though you can see tomorrow with a digital zoom um, it, the quality is going to suffer as soon as you switch into that mode so if you're buying a, an SLR uh, with a kit lens or with a telephoto lens uh, the, the focal lengths that you're looking for are the ones that are going to be the ones that are inside of the lens itself um, that said uh, there, there are great compact systems out there uh, my second camera is uh, it's made by Olympus. Uh, and it's a mirrorless camera. Um, it costs about a third of my DSLR kit. Uh, and I shoot with it probably more than I shoot with my DSLR kit because of the fact that it's lightweight. Because I can fit three lenses for the system in my cargo pocket. Uh, and those lenses are smaller. Uh, since they're smaller, they're inherently less expensive as well. Uh, and you can still get great results out of them as long as you know what you're doing. Uh, Sony also has a great line of cameras out that's called their NEX system. Uh, they're... They, blown up lately they're insanely popular because they're a it's a really small camera body with lenses that aren't huge but they put a gigantic sensor inside of it so the image quality is great um you can get one of those for under a thousand dollars uh you know which in photography terms it doesn't sound cheap but in photography terms that's you know not so bad uh and then canon and nikon also make their their entry-level cameras that come as a kit you can get for five six seven hundred dollars uh you know they're kind of stripped down on features compared to some of their their more expensive models but they still have on the inside uh what's necessary to, to make good photos especially in today's day and age the the gap between entry level and professional has closed uh exponentially uh an entry level canon dslr like they make one that's called the t5i it has the same sensor in it as their sub-professional model. So you're losing some of the features, maybe the quickness of speed or the quickness of focus, but the, the machine inside of the camera that still makes those images is exactly the same. And you're getting really, really good results out of them. So. And I've seen that with like Canon, like their EOS M, which is a smaller interchangeable right. mirrorless system, has the same type of sensor as their more expensive cameras. The other thing people should look at, too, is especially if it's your first camera, you don't necessarily have to get, as tempting as it is, the latest one out there, right? You don't need to get the T5i because the T3i and the T4i are still incredibly capable. And what I've noticed, too, is if you start to shop on Amazon or places like B&H or Adorama, these other camera places, look for some of the ones that you can see are starting to get discontinued because they'll discount them, you know, t two, three, four, five hundred dollars $500, and it's still, you know, it, it's... The day before, it was the most recent camera. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. And you bring up a, a fantastic point. Uh, Amazon and B&H and Adorama are probably the three biggest places for camera gear on the Internet. Um, you will find a better deal on all three of those any day of the week as compared to going like to a Best Buy to get a camera. Best Buy is a great place to pick up a camera, right. see how Hold it feels in your, hand, in your yeah. hands, and kind of get a feel for whether or not this is going to feel good for you. Because um, that's really important too, and we'll get to that in a second. But uh, when you when you decide what you want to get, buying it online is the best option. Almost all these places have free shipping. Uh, there's usually no tax involved because they're sending it halfway across the country. Um, Amazon Prime, baby, be uh, Amazon yeah, Prime. Amazon right? Prime, or if you're in college, Amazon Student, you get free Prime. I mean, stuff like that. You're getting really solid deals. You can also check uh, SlickDeals.net. 
Um, they're like a, an aggregate site. They find a lot of great deals for uh, technology and electronics, and cameras pop up on there quite often, too. Um, and you can even buy gear used. I mean, B&H has a huge used department uh, with cameras that are, you know, very, very, very lightly into their lifetime uh, that are deep discounted because of the fact that the box is open already or someone's already had their hands on it. So um, there are definite ways to go about doing it without burning a hole in your wallet uh, and still having something that, that you'll enjoy and, you know, be comfortable making images with. Yeah, and I like both B&H and uh, Amazon because I'll have uh, a lot of, like, not only do I like to look at the customer reviews, but they have videos. You know, they'll show you the unboxing of it. They'll show you what it looks like in the hand. And they'll give you some really good reviews to sort of help you wade through the literally, you know, hundreds, almost thousands of options that are out there. Yeah, and there are videos on their sites. And there's also uh, YouTube is a great resource for that kind of stuff, too. There are people on YouTube that, in the same vein as Lou and all of his friends with uh, Disney planning and, and all that good stuff, that are doing the same type of things for camera gear. There are tons of YouTube channels that have hundreds of thousands of subscribers and when they review a camera it kind of becomes the definitive place to to go and see because their opinions are held in very high regard so um that's a great place and youtube is also great if you're looking for things like uh, firework shows if you want to kind of get the timing right for those when you come down or parades or whatever you can kind of study youtube as well uh, i know i had to do that uh the first time i shot I think it was the Christmas fireworks here at Magic Kingdom. I watched the YouTube, like their 1080p YouTube videos. Though. I watched it 10 or 12 times because uh, I wanted to know when the timing was going to be so I could get the shot that I wanted to get. Um, so yeah, the, the Internet is a magnificent resource for us when it comes to almost everything nowadays. So it's a great place to... Well, and you know, YouTube and, and what you're saying, too, it brings up another point, uh, which we should mention, too. For a lot of these cameras, again, whether it's your iPhone, the point-and-shoots, or the, the mirrorless ones, a lot of these also shoot super high... I mean, they shoot full 1080p video. I mean, you can get some amazing video quality out of these as well, too. A lot of them have external mic jacks if you really want to sort of go pro or put on like a shotgun or a lav mic as well, too. Yeah, it's... They've made huge advancements in on-camera video. Uh, the, the Canon system especially uh they came out with a camera called the 5d mark ii back in i want to say 2007 or 2008 and it was one of the first dslrs that had like 24 30 fps video 1080p and it has spread it's almost become a standard on all these cameras to be able to have high definition video uh and like my my olympus camera that i shoot with it has 1080p hd video built in and it has image stabilization built into the body. So I can literally walk around these parks and even my clunky steps don't offset the sensor. And it, you know, it, it, for what I'm, I don't do a lot of video, but for what I'm doing, it's more than adequate. Uh, but for mom and dad who are coming here, you know, maybe spending $50, $100 more and, and stepping up a little bit, you now obviate the need to have your iPhone and a digital camera and a video camera. You can have all those things just in one device. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Um, the, the and for what they're going to be taking videos of kids first walk down main street kids meet mickey uh parades and stuff like that they'll perform wonderfully and it's not like uh my parents have all these videos of us from back in the day but they're on like the little tiny cassette tapes that used to plug into a vhs adapter that used to go into a vhs we don't have to worry about that kind of stuff anymore now because we're shooting in uh mov files or avi files at this point and you just throw them on an external hard drive you'll have them forever so pretty great so let's talk about um we we've come to the parks we've, we've got our gear we've got you know a gazillion photos i know again for me i go home and it's like well now what do i do you know because we take so many and i am, am incredibly guilty of i take them off from the camera and i dump them into a folder that just says disney 2013 and i never go through them again what are some things we should do once we get back and even some again easy to use bits of software, a lot of which, you know, if you're, especially if you're a Mac guy, comes with your, your, your uh, computer as well. Uh, the first one that I was going to say, if you're, if you're a Mac user, is iPhoto. Uh, when you plug your SD card into your, your MacBook or your iMac, uh, and you, if you want to import into iPhoto, it will automatically take what's called EXIF data, E-X-I-F, that's built into the files of the, the pictures, and it will organize everything by date and time for you. So you don't even have to really go in and say, okay 
WDW MK828 2013, um, it, the, the computer will do all of it for you. And then when you're in iPhoto, uh, iPhoto even has basic editing tools built in. Um, or if you're taking pictures on an iPhone or an iPad, uh, there are a plethora of editing apps that are built into there, too. I mean, iMovie and iPhoto on every new iOS device are free. They used to be 5 bucks, but now you get them every time you buy a new iPad or iPhone, which is that's, that's huge in my opinion because you're getting uh, pretty solid editing software completely free that comes with your device. Uh, or you could go the route of something like Snapseed, uh, which was made by Nick Software, which got gobbled up by Google uh, some time ago, which is fantastic. Um, there, I was there, a big Picasso user way back in my when I was a PC guy. Yeah, uh, Google actually bought Nick Software because they were so happy with Snapseed, and Picasso has kind of fallen to the wayside because uh, the power of the, the mobile uh, version of Snapseed, uh, which, I mean, these are programs where you can adjust exposure shadow levels, uh, clarity, saturation, individual color temperatures, you know, you can convert to black and white, you can add vignettes, you can, you can do a lot of advanced things on consumer-based software nowadays, which is, which is excellent. I mean, it makes it available to anyone instead of just professionals at this point. And what about, um, in terms of sharing, because uh, I know a lot of people, we, we take them home and we're like, well, now, we, you know, obviously, I think uh, Facebook has really sort of almost become the, uh, the de facto place that people want to go and, and upload their photos and share them. Yeah, Facebook is the, the best place to go if you want to share everything with your, with your friends and family, uh, because it's the largest social network on, on planet Earth. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg and his team have... <laughs> It's amazing to see where they were when I was in college, and you could only get a Facebook account if you had a .edu email address, compared to nowadays where literally the entire world is there. Um, but if you're if you're doing it as a as a serious hobby, uh, I mean, there's like we mentioned Flickr before. Um, there's another website that's a much smaller version of the same concept, but a lot more professional photographers post there. It's called 500px. Um, they, there's incredible work on there. Um, there are other places like SmugMug. If you want to host all of your photos or if you want to try to sell photos, you can sell through SmugMug or a place like Zenfolio. Um, th- like there are countless places where you can, you can host your images. Uh, I primarily use Flickr uh, because we have a large community that has been growing over the past four or five years of people that take photos here at the parks. Um, and that's kind of where we all met, so it's kind of where we all stayed. Um, I also post photos to my website, DisneyPhotographyBlog.com, uh, and I have a lot of work to do because we have an app that's called Disney Photo a Day where you get a brand new Disney photo every day, so that's 365 shots that I have to come up with for an entire year from the parks. Um, I know, woe is me, I have to come Which is here. a lot harder than it sounds, right? <laughs> it is. You don't want to do too many doubles and replicate too many things. How many castle pictures can you really put right? Yeah, well, trust me, I've <laughs> broken my own rules plenty of times with that, but... Uh, I mean, for for photo sharing, if it's, you know, you just want to show mom and dad, brother and sister, Facebook's great, Uh, but sites like Flickr and 500px, you can upload uh, much larger file sizes. So if you're using a a bigger camera or use something that has really high image quality, I think you can upload up to like 50 megabyte files, which most photos never get that big. I think my biggest files are like 20, 25 megs, so. And I think they said that the Flickr uploader app, uh, piece of software for your computer makes it very easy. It's very, it literally is just sort of dragging and dropping. It is now, yeah. Um, and then one of the cool things is that Flickr just went through a huge redesign where all of their users, you sign up for a free Flickr account, you get one terabyte of hosting space for free. You're never going to fill that up. You're never going to use that's entire what we, terabyte. That's what we said in the 80s about our, you know, Your 5 megabyte max. hard drive. Like, we'll <laughs> never fill up 5 megabytes. So. Yeah, well, I, as of right now, I... I have a couple terabyte hard drives at home, and they're nowhere near close to full. So, well, again, and they're so cheap. You know, a three terabyte drive now is so cheap. You'll never—I hate to say it—but you, you probably won't run out of space. Yeah, probably. You're, you're very cautious. There words. You're a former lawyer, <laughs> right. so. Um, but yeah, I mean, and then you also have cloud services too. Like, if you're using an iPhone, you have the iCloud Photo Stream where. Your most 1,000 recent photos are stored up on the cloud, and you can share those with other people 
uh, whether you're using iCloud to share it or with the new iOS software, you can airdrop it to someone who's right near you, which all you're doing is using a Bluetooth radio frequency and you're dropping a high-res photo from one phone to another. Uh, you have things like Dropbox, where if you sign up for a free account, you get, I think, like two and a half gigs worth of cloud storage. Uh, and you can use that for photos as well as anything else, documents, spreadsheets. Uh, and, and if you refer- and you, if you use the app, you can have it set to automatically upload all of your, your camera roll up yes. to your Dropbox folder. Yeah, absolutely. You take a photo, and at the same time, it'll upload to your photo stream on iCloud. It'll upload directly to your Dropbox folder. So you have your pictures in three different places, which is also a huge deal because in case you ever have a, a phone that breaks or if you have hard drive failure or anything, it's good to have backups too. So uh, the today's day and age is making it a lot easier, a lot easier for us to do that kind of stuff too. The, uh, the Google Plus app, which I love, uh, the Google Plus app also will do that as well. It'll upload it to your Google Plus account. It'll oh, okay. keep it private. And then if you want to share it, you just determine who, you, what circle, circles you want to share it to. Yeah. So, I mean, all these companies are making it way too easy for us. Yeah. I mean, back in the day, it was a, it was a hassle. And that's, that's why you see... Ask my mom. It's still a hassle. Well, yeah, well it's, <laughs> no judgment there. But, uh, I mean, back in the day, there were a lot more, quote-unquote, professional photographers because high-quality gear wasn't as accessible, film developing wasn't as accessible, uh, a platform to show your work wasn't as accessible. But nowadays, any almost anyone can buy a high-performing camera. Almost anyone can buy software for editing. And almost anyone, like if you go to... Uh, squarespace.com you can build a portfolio for ten dollars a month and they host your photos in high res and the website designs are beautiful i mean you're paying 120 bucks for a year and you have a very professional looking portfolio to help you get your name out so and i think too you know and we can and i should have you come back on because i think there's a lot more that we can cover especially about park specific and and doing different things but i think what people should do too is worry less about buying the expensive gear you know come into the parks and just shoot you know shoot like crazy but i think too they should watch and learn right there's there's an amazing amount of videos like you said on youtube where people will teach you how to use your camera how to frame stuff but i think they should go to to sites like yours again i think like disneyphotographyblog.com and your Flickr account and look at what you're doing right look at how you frame shots look at how you zoom in or zoom out how you sort of uh, you know, position everything in the frame and sort of watch and learn is really one of the best ways too. Yeah, I mean, the there are two great ways and this is one of the, the most wonderful things about photography is that photography is not like accounting or it's not like being a real estate agent or something. It, it is truly an art form. Uh, and you don't have to go to school for it. If you have a good eye and if you're willing to study, you can succeed. I mean, if you go to a place like Flickr or 500px, you can find just jaw-dropping, stunning, amazing work and inspire yourself to go out and do that. And then the other half of the, the puzzle is actually going out and try to put those applications in you know real-time use. Uh, I mean, I come here a lot to, to the parks uh, to shoot for you know the things that I have to do for my projects and whatnot, but while I'm here, I'm also practicing. I, it, it, it's a never ending quest. It is always evolving. There's always something new to do. There are always things changing here at the parks, so you're never running out of content. You're never getting dry. Uh, I mean, like the new Fantasyland opened in November last year. That opened up a whole new world of, of things to shoot. The Mine Train will be opening soon. They're they're building Avatar now. Uh, other, other parks in the area are building, you know, major expansions to their theme parks and stuff too I don't know what you're talking about I, I, uh, <laughs> no no judgment this is WDW radio right okay but I mean so in, in the area of Orlando and I mean anywhere that's out there there's so much to take pictures of whether it's people or landscapes or buildings or the beach or sunsets whatever I mean going out and actually putting the camera up to your face is the only way you're really going to get better um, doing the legwork at home by reading your camera manual or reading great blogs with people that are inspiring and have brilliant work is is one side of it but getting out there and actually doing it is is what's really going to bring success and like i said it doesn't cost you anything to shoot 50 100 more pictures while you're out so just shoot away while you're here um definitely go and check out disneyphotographyblog.com you can also download uh your disney photo a day app it's for ios and 
Uh, it's it's just for iOS. Okay. Um, we have one, which for is Walt, fine. We have yeah, we have one for Walt Disney World, uh, one for Disneyland, uh, and then we have also uh, a whole slew of iPad apps that are specific to each park with uh, super high res wallpapers for that. Uh, if you go to the site, you can find links for all of that. And we also have some ebooks that we put together on like fireworks photography. On we have a series of ebooks that are called like the. It's kind of like how that Stacy fellow does the must-dos on the resort network. It's kind of like a must-dos for photography. We have a series of ebooks for that. Um, and, you know, you, you go to the site, there's just a whole bunch of free articles, uh, you know, free tutorials. We have some videos on YouTube about processing and uh, just lots of pretty pictures, if that's all you care to go look at, too. So... I'll definitely put links to all the stuff in the show notes. Corey, thanks so much. Check is in the mail, by the way. Awesome. Well, listen, I want to have you come back. This is good stuff. Um, and now we need to go and, and eat and shoot and and, sh- and and shoot while we're eating, which is a whole you know, food food uh, <laughs> food photography at Disney World could be a whole show in and of itself. Yeah, man, citrus rolls around me. For our Walt Disney World trivia question of the week, where I ask you to test your knowledge of Walt Disney World history, see how well you pay attention to the details of what you see or maybe even hear, and then enter to win a Disney prize package. Before we get to this week's question, let's go back, review last week's, and select our winner. So, on the last show, we were talking about Halloween in Walt Disney World and my favorite parade, and I asked you to name three characters in the Mickey's Boo to You Halloween parade that are exclusive to that parade. They may be able to be found elsewhere in the parks, but that's the only parade they participate in. Well, again, hundreds of you entered, must love that parade and the characters as well. And the number of Disney characters that are exclusive to Mickey's Boo to You Halloween Parade include Big Al from the Country Bear Jamboree, Captain Barbosa, Christopher Robin, Kanga and Rue, Shenzi, Banzai and Ed from The Lion King, and of course, the three hitchhiking ghosts from the Haunted Mansion. So again, I asked you to pick any three from those. Hundreds of you entered. I randomly selected one winner for a prize package that includes all of the audio tours of Walt Disney World, a luggage tag, button, and a signed copy of my second edition of the Walt Disney World Trivia Book. And the winner last week is Paula Moore. So Paula, congratulations. I'll get your package out to you right away. If you played last week and didn't win, thanks for playing. But don't worry, because here's your next chance to enter in this week's Walt Disney World Trivia Challenge. So there's been a lot of buzz this week about the upcoming Avatar expansion to one of my favorite parks, obviously Disney's Animal Kingdom. Disney just released some new concept art and models. It is not a zoo and certainly won't be when this expansion opens in a few years. But while it still focuses on conservation now, it also features some of Walt Disney World's most thrilling attractions, including Dinosaur. And on the attraction, you encounter a number of different dinos, but you're only supposed to bring back one. So tell me, what type of dinosaur do you bring back with you from your trip to the Cretaceous period? So many of you asked that I would once again bring the trivia questions back to a weekly instead of bi-weekly format, so you only have one week to enter. You have until Sunday, October 20th at 11.59 p.m. to send your answer to contest at wdwradio.com. Again, you're playing for the all six of my audio walking tours of the Magic Kingdom, a WDW Radio luggage tag, button and a signed copy of my Walt Disney World trivia book so good luck and have fun that's going to do it for this week's show thanks again for taking the time to tune in this and every week in addition to the audio podcast, which you can subscribe to over on iTunes, don't forget about our weekly live video broadcast and chat every Wednesday night over at www.radiolive.com. It's a chance for you to be involved in the show as I talk about this week's Walt Disney World news. You can interact right there in the chat room. If you can't watch it live, that's okay. You'll find it on our YouTube channel. 
and the audio in the iTunes feed as well. Additionally, be sure and visit the website over at www.radio.com. Look for our multiple daily blog posts, contests, photos, new videos, our free email newsletter, and a way for you to download the free WW Radio iPhone app for your iOS or Android device. You can also meet and chat with other Disney fans in our fun, family-friendly discussion forums and lots more. You know I love hearing from you as well, too, so if you have a question you want answered on the air, you can email me at lou at wdwradio.com or call the voicemail. I'll be heard on the air with a question, a comment, or just a hello from the parks at 407-900-9391. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Lou Mangiello. And come by, like the page over on facebook.com slash wdwradio. And as much as I love connecting with you guys online, nothing beats a handshake and a hug. So visit the events page over at www.radio.com for information about our upcoming meets of the month in Walt Disney World, other special events like cruises and trips to Disneyland and other locations around the country and maybe even around the world. Stay tuned for some announcements about some upcoming events for 2014 and beyond coming very, very soon. Quick thanks to my partners and sponsors. Mouse Fan Travel, as you know, is my official recommended travel provider because it's who I use. So if you come into Walt Disney World or going out to Disneyland, Adventures by Disney, or going on a Disney cruise, visit mousefantravel.com for the, all the best possible prices, all available discounts, and an incredible level of personal service that is their hallmark all at no additional cost to you. And as always, my friends, and you are my friends, whether we have met yet or not, all I ask is that if you like the show, please help spread the word. Let others know about it. Tweet out that you're listening. Come by, rate and review the show and the app over in iTunes. Tweet out that you're listening or come by, comment, share your thoughts and, and share links over on the Facebook page as well. And finally, and most importantly, I want to thank each and every one of you for taking the time to listen this and every week, to watch the newscast, watch the videos, connect with me on all the different social networks. Most importantly, for allowing me to share my passion for Disney with you through the show and so many other ways. And I want you to have that same feeling I do every day where you get to love what you do. So remember, you only have one life. Spend it wisely. Live the life you dream about. Never quit. Have faith. And always keep moving forward. Have a great week, everybody. So until next time, see ya. It's Lauren Winnicka Kaplan from Hillsboro, New Jersey, and I haven't even finished listening to the Indiana Jones uh, podcast yet, but I had to call and tell you my family story about when we were picked to be uh, one of the extras in the show. So uh, my first time I ever went to Disney was about 1995, and uh, it was the entire Winnicka family, about 10 of us, and uh, my grandfather was in one of those little motorized scooters. So going to the show, we had to split up five and five, and half of us went with my grandfather to sit in, um, you know, where he could park his scooter or where he could sit. So uh, fast forward to when they're picking the volunteers, and I'm sitting with my mom and my dad and, and my sister and other family members, and my mom starts jumping up and down, and we start pick, and uh, we start pointing to her, and my mom gets picked, and she gets to go down, and she does a scary laugh, and it's amazing. And I'm 10 years old, and it's just the best thing ever. So we think, okay, that's great, and we see her go up and, and start getting fitted for her costume or wherever she went. So then they pick the next round of volunteers, and uh, and they come down, and, and keep in mind that two halves of my family were on separate sides of the stadium. Well, wouldn't you know, but they picked my grandmother also from the complete other side. From thousands of people, they picked two Winnickers, and my grandmother goes up, and she has to stand on one leg and sit down, you know, you know, pretzel style on one leg. And my mom said that when my grandmother came back to get her costume, she thought that this was her mother-in-law. She thought she was coming to tell her something or take a picture of her. But no, she was in the show, too. And they did great. And then afterwards, they got recognized in the ladies' room. And one kid asked to sign, uh, asked them to sign their Mickey Mouse book. So um, that's my story. I haven't been since '95, but I should really go again next time I'm down. Anyway, thanks for everything that you do, and talk to you soon. Bye. You've-